This lesson is two separate things. The first one is, is this, those who have not heard a discussion about the theoretical Bushman. More importantly, what this is, is my greatest attempt yet to abbreviate, because I have been trying to do too much in a 15 minute period. So um, that is my greater lesson here. But the reason I wanted to uh, discuss this is because this question came up for me again uh, recently with somebody. Um, we'll cover the verses in a moment, but the question gets asked, well, what about the Bushman? What about the person who, who's never heard the word at all, who doesn't know? It? Surely God doesn't condemn him, uh, um, does he? It's, it's kind of the question. Let's look at the verse that might bring this up. Romans 10, 13, and 14. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? So you can go to this verse right away and point out the fact that without preaching there's no hearing, without hearing there's not believing, without believing there's no saving. Therefore, for the people who have not been preached to, what happens to them? Now this is why the question comes up. At least that's, that's why, this is why I think it does. This is the God can't mean an argument. If saving is preceded by believing, believing is preceded by hearing, then those that haven't heard cannot know to listen, and therefore they cannot be saved. That's the first conclusion you'd come to. So then some subsequent conclusions. Therefore, salvation is not dependent on anything at all. Or else, God, or the judgment or afterlife, must not exist at all, or... God is unfair, because if it exists, yet some people haven't heard, and he condemns them, that seems like unfairness, because they didn't have a proper chance. That's sort of the conclusion that people are going for, at least when this question has been asked of me. Nobody's nodding in agreement with that, so maybe I'm already way off. But this has been my experience. This is what they are trying to include. See, why would, why would I want to obey a God who isn't willing to give everybody an equal chance? That's essentially what's being suggested. So, um, I do have responses to this. My, my desire here, my purpose was to kind of codify a few of these quickly into something that could be reviewed quickly. So, let's uh, offer a rebuttal to the, to the question here. These are simply verses. God made man to listen. This is the first principle, and here's the verses I would use to prove it. God made man to listen. Those who have not heard, what about them? Well, God made them to listen. Acts 17, 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he actually is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for indeed we are his offspring. So suggesting here that it is a, a kind of a, I don't want to use the word inbred, but it is, it is a part of man's nature to seek the creator, and the creator has made himself very available. Acts 14, 17 says, He did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So if you want witness of his existence, these are things that are available to everyone, right? Rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, the Bushman sees those more than we do. <laughs> um, so there is a witness there. That doesn't mean he has all the truth, but there is cause enough for him to start listening. Romans 1, for what can be known about God is plain to them, speaking of the, um, the Gentiles or even the pagans, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. And I, I think there's a play on, of terms maybe going on here. Invisible attributes clearly perceived. Ever since the create, what are they? It's the creation, the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. God made man to listen. That is the first rebuttal I would have. And these verses suggest that they have that inborn desire to seek a creator. Another rebuttal. Sin is still a problem. Equal judgment for all is precisely fair. The conclusion of the person who has the question is that there's unfairness here. But, but I would suggest the exact opposite. If God is to judge some, he must judge all, regardless of whether or not they have heard. Now, the hearing is necessary. But the sin is the problem. God is not the problem here. God didn't make a mistake. The sin is the problem. Romans 2. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and the Greek, 
but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. His standard of righteous behavior is the same for everybody. This is fairness. Otherwise, you have to suggest that the people who learn, and there's an extent to which this actually is true, but the people who know are more at risk of condemnation for having sought and learned than the people are who remain ignorant. And that's an impossible conclusion to reach. God is not unfair. He shows no partiality. Hearing at all, in fact, and the time that we are given, that is, to hear, is mercy itself. God has shown everybody time to give them an opportunity to seek him and to listen. He has put themselves, he has put himself near to them. He has given them rain and seasons to recognize that a creator exists. And he is patient with us for thousands of years. He's been giving us the time to observe what's going around us and ask questions. So, as I was saying a moment ago, the gospel isn't a problem either. Are the ignorant safer? Because this is the argument you're coming up with. Basically, as long as those people remain ignorant, okay, as long as they have no knowledge of the truth, God can't possibly condemn them or else it would be unfair. Well, not according to Paul. I won't turn to all these, but three examples. I do not want you to be uninformed, ignorant, unaware. This is 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 11, and 1 Thessalonians 4. In each instance, his point is to these people. 1 Thessalonians, he's talking about the resurrection. For example, there's, there's numerous, numerous subjects here. But the point that he's making is, is look, your ignorance puts you in danger. Whatever comes after this, whatever the subject is, the point is, is that they cannot be unaware because their ignorance puts them in danger. So, the gospel can't be a problem because Paul is out there to teach it. Is protection from the word a key to salvation? That's what you would have to suppose to get there. In other words, we're told to... He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That is not, make sure you don't go into the whole world, because the fewer people that know, the better off they will be. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. Certainly, it is not the admonition of Jesus and apostles to conceal the word. Therefore, the ignorant are not safer. The ignorant must be taught. And fortunately, God has provided an opportunity for them to seek. And continuing the rebuttal, we are admonished to teach. We are admonished to teach. And we're getting pretty close here to the purpose of the question, I believe. Stand a man before me who you can prove has never heard. And I will show you the man you just gained an opportunity to teach. All right, go out and find him. And now that you've found him, teach him. Because <laughs> if, if half as much effort was placed on finding and teaching the Bushmen as is placed on finding and not teaching the Bushmen, I, I mean, there's an extraordinary amount of effort to theorize about the person that exists that you don't know about that needs to be taught. Well, if, if you're worried about that person, if you want to prove their existence or address this issue, address the issue. This is a hypothetical question. And when it's asked more than once, I believe it's dishonest in its motives. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be asked the first time. Oh, I never really thought about that before. Well, if we're looking for a person who hasn't been taught, what do we do once we've found them? We're admonished to teach. So, my conclusion is God demands that we work. We aren't required to deal in the unproven hypothetical. Rather than what about the person I cannot prove exists, ask, am I teaching the person I know exists? How many people have we ignored to start worrying about the Bushmen we've never seen before? Does he exist? I'm not trying to claim he doesn't. However, there's a lot of people between me and him. And meanwhile, God is patient with all of us and gives that man an opportunity to look at the creation around him and decide, you know what? I should be asking questions. So let's look at this verse again and think about this. How then will they call on him, on him in whom they have not believed? The answer is they can't. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? The answer is they can't. That doesn't mean that we are the only opportunity for them to hear, but they can't. This is stating what is true. How are they to hear without someone preaching? The answer is, they can't receive the full truth unless somebody talks to them. How are they to preach unless they, that is someone, are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And this is the part that I left off at the beginning. Those who have not heard are primed to listen. God, that was a bad choice of color. Those who have not heard are primed to listen. God gave them evidences around them, even in the most... I'll say base, I don't mean base in an ugly way, in the most rudimentary of circumstances to recognize that there is a creator that they should be seeking. This is an admonition to do our job. 
not to not do our job, to not admission to do our job. So the question is, are we doing our job? God demands that we work. These people out here need to be taught. And so I would suggest to the person who asked this question, very well. Go out and find the person who has never heard. And once you're out there in the bush, ankle deep in the mud, or the bush, or whatever it might be, rather than say, well, I found you to prove my point, go ahead and teach them. That's what we have been admonished to do. And that is the end of my sermon. Thank you.